model car fans. Welcome to the Muscle Car Modeler. My name is Ralph, and this week I'm going to feature uh, actually a pair of uh, Ford Model Ts. These are both 1925 uh, models, of course, but the Ford Model T was a game changer in its day. And I've been reading a little bit more about the early history of the automobile and what was going on at that time, and basically the technology struggle. And more recently, since uh, I've had to take some training with GM because of the current uh, EV sales and some of the things to expect and talk to customers about. So it's kind of fun for me to look at the early days because some of the information kind of cracks me up when I talk about certain headlines in the electric car. And, and then I like to read a little farther into some of that stuff and, and mostly just for fun and my own entertainment. So, you know, in the early days, um, you know, trying to see who made what first. And I found it interesting that the electric car predates the gas car, or at least in most accounts, but you know, that can be debated. Um, one thing that is very stated is uh, the very first gas powered vehicle, horseless carriage was in 1885 and it was built by Benz, not Mercedes Benz, just Benz. And uh, they are definitely credited as the first uh, gas powered vehicle. And the first most commonly credited uh, electric vehicle is 1895's Electrobat, um, but that was a mass-produced vehicle. There was actually one um, credited, uh, a Scottish inventor in 1832 built his own horseless carriage with an electric motor and uh, batteries to propel it. It wasn't very fast. None of them were the early cars. That is way ahead of the time uh, of that time. Now, a couple of things with that particular one is um, it wasn't, it was a one-off thing that a guy had invented and built. He didn't build others and he didn't sell them. And also it did not have a rechargeable battery at all. You basically had to change the battery. So it was much like a, um, you know, changing out a double A or something like that. Uh, the rechargeable battery wasn't invented until like 1859. So it was kind of interesting, you know, for me to find that and read that. But in the early days, even as early as uh, 1900, the um, automotive landscape, it was very expensive to own a car. So really only the rich could own them. And most of them were, uh, uh, it was quite a mix actually. There was a number of steam cars offered uh, and then, you know, there was a few uh, gas powered cars, but there was a lot of electric cars at that time. And I found that quite fascinating to read that. Now, a lot of them did not have uh, any high speeds. Um, most of them could only go like 20 miles an hour, but even these Model Ts, they weren't very fast, but there weren't any really paved roads uh, back then. So, you know, they were, you know, as fast as a carriage or anything like that. And, you know, you really weren't flying in any of these cars. But it was a much different time period. In uh, 1900, it says, you know, depending on the articles you read, I read one and three or one and four were an electric car. Now, these are all city cars and there was multiple um, ones out there. But when Ford came out with this Model T, uh, which came out in 1908, so the automotive landscape was changed. and his credit, uh, the, the main thing that happened with the Ford Model T, and it wasn't right away, is it became the first affordable car for the middle class. And it really took off. Now, not so much in the early years. And um, there's some more stuff with that. So one of the things why I bring up the electric car is I keep, you know, I keep seeing statistics where, you know, Jim's trying to say they're the first ones to mass produce an electric car with the, the Saturn EV one with the, you know, 1100 units made. But there was another one in the 1800s that was a more of a taxi or, or something like that, where they, uh, I guess there was a couple thousand made. So that was definitely a much more mass produced than even the Saturn EV one. And one article really made me laugh. Um, they actually made a, a, an electric Corvair as a concept car, the Electrover, um, Corvair, and there was an early one, which I don't know if it's 62 or 63, but then there was a 66 that GM still has in their collection, um, but those were not mass produced and sold, but uh, that's the Electrover 2. 
which made me laugh about a headline which says GM's first electric car, the Electrovere 2. And I'm like, it's named 2 because it's the second one. Uh, but the first one, I guess, isn't around. But they did some testing. It wasn't any faster than your standard Corvair and everything, but the battery technology was not there. Uh, they found that out pretty quickly where they can get the thing moving and everything. And the Corvair was really easy to swap an electric motor in because of that. I'm kind of rambling a little too long on, on electric car history, but they did say on the Electrovere 2 that um, one of the things that really killed that was the batteries could only be charged like a hundred times and then they had to be replaced and they were just way too expensive and not practical for that. But where that brings in the Model T here is the Model T is actually credited for killing the electric car in that time period because, you know, consumer demand, some of the cheap electric cars were seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars $1,800. And this at one point in time was down to $650 to buy um, one of these. So the Model T is credited for killing the electric car in that time period. And kind of the steam powered car, but it's funny reading the ads on some of these because gasoline cars were dangerous. They were explosive. You can you know hurt yourself trying to start one of these things, but um, they were fairly practical as far as getting it cranked and started. Once you got it started, you have to wait very long. Electric ones were a little bit different back then. Uh, didn't really get any reviews on how long or the range, but you know the fastest ones were 20 miles an hour, and the range wasn't very far. It uh, doesn't really say how long it took to charge some of those. But the steam-powered cars, those were like the most efficient, but you needed, you know, 15, 20 minutes, sometimes 45 minutes for that to warm up and get the steam built up to where you can actually drive those. And uh, they were, you know, kind of a uh, explosive crock pot on wheels too. And they had gasoline to warm up the burners too, or kerosene. Uh, what made the cars appealing at that time was gasoline was cheap in the 1900s. It was actually a byproduct of kerosene. And because of that, um, it was like, a product that was being made that was worthless and useless. Well, now it's the other way around. You know, we don't need kerosene or use kerosene for lighting or heating our houses or anything. But, you know, and gasoline is uh, highly revered and high demand. So when it came to these, um, you know, that was it. And there wasn't any gas stations back then. If you needed gas, you went to your hardware store and you would buy it, sometimes in glass jars by the gallon, and you'd put them in, the, in these cars. They didn't hold much. Another thing with the drama with the Ford Model T um, and Ford at the time was they had partnered with the Dodge Brothers and the Dodge Brothers were building engines, trannies, and chassis for these things uh, in the early years. And they had quickly found out neither one of them really liked being dependent on each other. The Dodge Brothers didn't like that uh, their main client was Ford and Ford didn't like the idea that they had to be very reliant on uh, Dodge. There was problems Ford was having trouble paying uh, the Dodge Brothers. And it said they were Ford was paying them $250 per chassis, basically. Chassis engine training rear end. Ford was uh, building their own bodies and wheels and putting them on the early cars. And um, so that relationship kind of went sour as the Dodge brothers were getting upset and they wanted their money. And at one point, Ford owed them like $7,000. Um, it's a lot of money back then. And the Dodge brothers decided they came to an agreement because they still needed each other to keep themselves in business because Dodge was threatening to stop making chassis for them and they'll make their own cars. But they still needed each other and Ford couldn't uh, handle the interruption. He didn't have the money and tooling to get to that stage yet, but this was early on in the Model T's. So the agreement was the Dodge brothers would loan Ford another $3,000 in exchange for Ford giving them 10% stock in the Ford Motor Company. That ended up being a ludicrous deal for the Dodge brothers and it brought them uh, immense wealth um, a few years later as the Model T production had sped up and was getting better as he developed the assembly line and really got his uh, uh, production running and the costs were starting to come down on these. What else is interesting is the Dodge Brothers 
they canceled their contract eventually and started to build their own vehicles. So about 1914, 1915, um, they separated their uh, relationship with Ford and went on their own. But by then they were getting paid handsomely because these ran from 1908 to 1927 and about 15 million of these were made. By 1914, uh, it was saying that roughly uh, half of all the cars in the United States were Ford Model Ts. So these things, you know, you couldn't beat them in price and everybody could afford one. So, and then they had multiple bodies. Another thing that I had heard many times was Ford was famous for saying, you can have any color you want so long as it's black. Well, I found out that's not true, especially when you get into reading about the early cars, the 1908, 1909. I guess none of the early cars were actually black. They had uh, gray, uh, dark blue, red, uh, dark green, and then later, you know, some of them with the black fenders. But I guess the all black ones really didn't start out until much later, like 1914, 1915, when he really got his assembly line going and the, the price had come down and he was just painting them all black, which is what I did here as uh, 1927s, or actually 1925s. So I found all of that fascinating. There's much more fascinating interest in that, although the cars themselves, very basic, no shocks, no front brakes. Um, these things, you know, you weren't going over 30 miles an hour in the things. And, you know, basic four cylinders. And I really couldn't get any, you know, specs or much about the motor as far as a Dodge Brothers motor in one of these versus, you know, Ford's motor, um, how much different they were, if they were actually different, um, who actually owned the rights to the tools, you know, some of the details, but really wasn't finding any of that. But when it comes to building these, these are AMT kits and, you know, they came out uh, re-released, uh, I think, 10 years ago with the multiple packs where you can build them as custom or as the stock ones. But these ones, I decided to build them stock and do it this way. And I had fun doing it and they were really simple, easy builds, especially when everything is black. And, you know, there's the four cylinder in that one, which these are pretty much the same kit as far as the chassis go, other than the different cabs. Now they had like four different versions of course this is a truck that one's the the tall t i believe is what this is called um then they had the touring uh which i like to build one of those but i have an amt kit of that to build stock also but it's a model a which speaking of the model a ford really didn't want to uh, update that but he was kind of forced the model t's for sales were slowing down the other cars were getting much better and one of the final nails in the coffin was the invention of the electric starter, which uh, killed a lot of the fear of owning a gas powered car back in the day. So, you know, and, and, but that came a little bit later, but it's interesting reading about the early technology and what was going on with these things back then and just how simple and basic the cars actually are. So it's, it's interesting and kind of scary. And the fact that the brakes on this are not hydraulic at all, they're strictly like cable operated and you look at how these things are constructed you know there's a lot of wood the sheet metal is actually just the outside there's the inner structure and the firewall or the dash was all wood and just covered in tin you know that's one of the reasons why they call them the tin lizzie is this tin sheet metal and it's over you know wood frame structure but that was you know the construction back then and uh, just 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 some fun and interesting trivia there but um, so I, I built these and kind of enjoyed them and, you know, have them in my collection. And they're kind of a pain to clean off and dust off, but uh, dusted them both off for you. Um, not the fanciest paint jobs, you know, didn't really worry about clear coating them or how nice the paint jobs actually are. Because, you know, the paint jobs on the original cars were not like this. But just fun, fascinating history and time back then. But that's when the consumers made the decision. The government didn't do it for you. And... You know, like uh, electric cars are being uh, pushed and government subsidized to to get them out and in in there or using emissions or environmental reasons for building them because you can get into that debate all day long and it's kind of crazy. But you know, that's you know today versus back then. But it's just an interesting time for me to read about and get into. Kind of rabbling on a little long, but wanted to show these off and. 
you know, share them with you guys. And, you know, I'm sure some of you have built some of these. I don't see too many of them built stock, uh, building the street rods. But, um, you know, they're just kind of fun, neat little kits. Nothing really uh, um, super stellar about them. You know, and it's just some of the different controls and how they worked as far as steering and, you know, advancing the choke on them and, you know, knowing how to operate one of these. So just some interesting history and kind of stuff that I kind of get into in favor. So I, I like reading about that stuff and you're reading about electric history is kind of new to me. But some of the steam powered cars and some of the technology that was going on back then. And um, uh, another quick one real quick. I was reading about another electric vehicle that was built. It was a horseless carriage that uh, would only do about four miles per hour, but it was able to carry six tons. And this was in the early 1900s as well. And uh, the railway workers, you know, found out about it and, you know, were threatened by its abil uh, ability to haul, you know, six tons. Even though it was four miles an hour, they were threatened by it. So, you know, the railway workers were worried about it competing against steam powered locomotives and they actually destroyed that car. It was uh, demolished. So it was kind of interesting reading about that. But um, anyway, that's kind of enough on this as I've rambled on long enough. So you guys, uh, thank you for tuning in, subscribing and listening to me and all the fun history that I like to dig up and talk about, even if it drags these videos on kind of long. But you guys, you have a wonderful weekend and I'll see you next Saturday.